Uh, I, I do this talk a lot in Europe, actually quite a popular talk there, and only recently I brought it to the US and Canada. A few weeks ago I was in, in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, did it for a, 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 at the Path to Agility conference. There were uh, 400 people in the room, big keynote that was, and then I went to Canada and I did it in Toronto and in Montreal, and there were sort of respectively, I think, 200 people and 100 people in the room. And now we have here 25, so this seems to be like my career is in decline. Right? <laughs> the next one is going to be a private session with someone somewhere. Anyway, so um, this is this is called How to Change the World, and, and this is the this is the American version of it because I thought, okay, let's do some Europe promotion here in in America because Europe needs it. I can tell you. And uh, so we have a, a European geography lesson interspersed. Uh, uh, Slide. This this is Europe. This is Europe. this is the old continent, as some people would uh, would say. Uh, I think it is a fascinating place. I love being here. I travel all across Europe, uh, and uh, it is actually the only continent that works exactly like the human brain, because most of the parts waste most of their energy disagreeing with each other. <laughs> And, and any sense of unity and identity is merely an illusion. So that is, that is typical for Europe and then the human race. And this is where I'm from. The Netherlands, very small country. Very, very small country. It's so small that most of us have learned to sleep standing up. <laughs> and uh, I live now with, uh, with Raoul, who's over there at the back of the room. I live here in Belgium, in Brussels. Another very, very small country. And uh, that, so that will be the recurring theme, the map of Europe here in, in, in this uh, in this talk. And, uh, and Brussels, by the way, you probably know Brussels as the capital of Europe. Uh, <laughs> capital, sort of. It's often referred to as a city, but it isn't. It's, it's actually a very, very big traffic accident that formed its own government. So, uh, but it's, it's a nice place to be. Anyway. I like uh, I like starting this talk with with, um, uh, with, a, with a story about my failures. For 15 years, I have failed, and I'm very proud of that. Actually, very proud of my failures. We can learn so much. Uh, I uh, I remember I was uh, one of my one, my biggest failures was uh, at the end of the 90s in the dot com hype. Uh, I had this this website that was doing very well. And uh, I, it was about computer games, a list of the most popular computer games in the world. It was quite popular. I made more money with my website for advertising and sponsors than with my daytime job. So I thought, well, let's turn this into a, a startup. Everyone was, was, was so starting up new businesses around the time. So I created a fantastic looking business plan with many, many, many uh, graphs and, and diagrams that, that showed that revenues would go up and, 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 and profits would go up, and the number of employees would go up, and my ego would go up, and everything would go up. Everything would, would be bigger. Uh, and it was, it was so good that I got an award uh, that year as the Entrepreneur of the Year in 1999 in my country for a plan. So best entrepreneur for a plan. So um, I got uh, I got informal informal investors to invest in that startup. Uh, One million euros they gave me and my team of five six people, and we were very very successful at spending all that money to the last euro. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't find any customers. That was a bit of a problem. So, uh, but no no problem. I, I already found myself a new idea. I, I started writing a book and I failed. I started uh, as a cartoonist and I failed and I had some other business ideas and they all failed. I remember I was once in a job interview with, a, with, an, em with an employer because, hey, I needed some money so I was, I was trying to find a job and I told them, being the honest Dutch person that I am, uh, look, you have to know, I basically destroyed all the previous businesses where I worked. <laughs> Actually, that turned into a new business idea. Why don't you hire me and make me work for your competitor? <laughs> I will annihilate them. Now, anyways. So, um, this, this, was, this went on and on for about 15 years. But then things started changing. 
and only a few uh, weeks ago, uh, one or two months ago, this list was published uh, by InfoQ, the organizer of the QCOM conference, coincidentally. This list of the most influential people in Agile, I have it in quotes here, intentionally. And Mike Cohn, Ken Schwaber, Bob Martin are, are the most influential, and look who's here at number six. Yay, I finally achieved something, isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, I have to be honest with you, uh, I, I've seen how, um, uh, how the statistics were made, the, the person who created that, uh, that list, Paul Darrell, I know him, I, I know how he made that list, and if I had not found it, this list, I would have dismissed it as total, as total nonsense, of course, right? <laughs> but now that I am on the list, I can only assume it's pretty accurate. <laughs> I think there are actually 10 people in the world who think that this, this is accurate, and they're all here. <laughs> Anyways, it, it is a sign that I, this thing started changing, and that's uh, probably because of this blog, Noah Doesn't Nail, that I started writing uh, four years ago. It was it's quite a success, and I wrote this book, Management 3.0, uh, for uh, for managers, the role of the manager in, in agile organizations. It's doing pretty well. The publisher's quite happy with it. Uh, I have a course based on the book that's doing quite well. I travel all over the world. And uh, uh, all over Europe as well, although I have to admit I have not been in Greece. <laughs> that is a bit of a problem. I think I should take some responsibility for that. I should have gone there earlier, I think, with my course. <laughs> but I, yeah, I was at a, a conference, in, as I said, in Columbus for Pact for Agility, and, and, and uh, Chris Avery was there. He's very famous for, for the, the discussing responsibility and accountability, saying we should take more often responsibility for the things that we do and don't. Okay. So, so, okay, Chris, I'm taking responsibility. I'm, I have not been to Greece, Greece early enough. I, I should have done that. Uh, but anyway, it's too late now. Sorry. But uh, the question that I get often is, is how do you do that? Uh, you have been a pathetic, miserable failure for 15 years, is what people say. Mm, they maybe they, well, they think, usually they think that, um, and now you have a few successes, so how did you achieve that? Well, I think I learned a few, uh, uh, a few things to, to, to influence people, and that's a common theme in this, in this talk. Because in my courses, I usually start by asking people, what are your biggest problems? What is it that you struggle with? And then I get questions like, how do I make the rest of the organization more agile? Or, or how can I motivate my employees that they develop themselves or start test-driven development or, or whatever? Or how can I convince customers that they should accept Scrum? And how do I change the managers in my organization? So it's the same question, isn't it? How do I change other people's behavior? Because I know what they should be doing, but they're not doing it. I have a good idea, but now everyone should, should start doing things. So how can we be successful at influencing other people? That's, a, that's, a, that's the pattern behind these questions. And it seems to be an important question because according to the state of Agile survey uh, by version 1, produced every year, uh, uh, consistently organizational culture is, is mentioned as the biggest problem, the biggest obstacle in, in Agile uh, transformation. And also, the general resistance to change is one of the biggest obstacles. So, changing the organizational culture, resistance to change, is perceived by the people uh, uh, trying to be agile as, as the main barriers. So, it is obvious that people struggle with that question. How do we change organizations? How do we change social complexes? And that is something that I tried to look into, and, and I found a number of books and the best ones, I, I read like five, six, or seven books, but these four were, I think, the best. Uh, Leading Change, Influencer, Switch, and Fear is Change. Probably there are some books that some of you recognize here. Fantastic books about change management. Changing people's behaviors. And uh, I discovered what I would call the four facets of, of social change. It, uh, and I call it the, the Mojito Method. This is the Mojito Method. Uh, apply to change, but basically all the ingredients already exist. I, I'm not telling you anything new here, everything is already out there. All the ingredients already exist, but I just stir it together and then you end up with something that's even more amazing. Same with the mojito, the ingredients were already there, pretty boring, taken separately. But when you stir them together, it seems to work. 
So the Mino method <coughs> applies to change uh, management. First the overview, and now we'll go into more detail. You have to be a systems thinker. That's part one. Nowadays I prefer to call the term complexity thinking. That's a small detail. You can ignore it. So be a systems thinker. Part two, you have to change the individuals at the individual level because many of them are not doing things rationally. There are other parts, other aspects to consider, emotions and that kind of stuff. Uh, part three, it is like trying to inject a virus in a social network. You want the behaviors to be copied across the social network. And number four, you have to consider the environment. Because maybe you can change the boundaries and then you will change the people uh, inside. All right, let's see what, the, <clears throat> what those individual uh, uh, parts mean in more detail. Dance with the system, I call the first one. And the uh, best model for that, the PBCA cycle. Plan, do, check, act. Actually, there are many versions of it. Uh, we have started calling it inspect and adapt in, in, in the agile world. And in the lean startup movement, they call it build, measure, learn. It's the same thing again and again, more or less. It's doing things iteratively. Experiment and see what you see what you learn from it. I use the good old PDCA cycle uh, uh, in honor of, of Deming and Schuhart. I think it works fine for the, for this uh, for this talk. Uh, in every part, I collected the, the questions, the main questions that those books, those four books, seem to present. The questions that you have to ask yourself. And in the plan part, there are the questions: What is your goal, and where are things going well? Two very important questions. What is your goal? Like, for example, with the Agile Manifesto, 17 people got together and they had an idea to change software development around the world. They had a goal. And they also answered the questions, the question, where are things going well? Because they shared some good ideas, some practices. They had successful pro projects. They knew what worked for them. So they could answer those two questions. And they developed a vision and they analyzed where things were going well. Those are very, two very important questions to, to get started with. For example, <clears throat> I was at a conference in Germany. This is Germany, the big ugly one in the middle. <laughs> this is Germany. I was at a conference there last year in February. And of course, there were many Germans. That happens with conferences in Germany that you have many Germans attending there. But uh, there seemed to be almost nobody from Austria, nobody from Switzerland. Well, it actually was right near the border with Austria. This is Austria. And Switzerland. This is Switzerland. Nobody from Austria, nobody from Switzerland. There were four people from Canada. For some strange reason. I keep walking into Canadians in Europe. It is, it is a fishing thing, I can tell you. Robert Diamond, J.R. JR, uh, J.B. Reisberger, uh, Janet Gregory, Michael Sahoda, etc., etc. Canadians everywhere. In trying to take over the world, so be, uh, be aware of that. But anyway, we uh, we noticed that there were nobody from Switzerland, nobody from from Austria, and we we said this is not good because all the all those communities in Europe they tend to focus on their own little territories. We have Agile Holland, Agile Finland, Agile Spain, Agile Austria, times 50, right? And then the people don't even know each other. They're all working on their own, in their own little countries. So we had a vision, pan-European collaboration. We have to collaborate as Europe. Great vision. And we knew it was going well, because as soon as we were in a bar having drinks with each other, we got projects started. Yay! Let's start this thing. Well, we have a new idea. Let's organize a conference. Ta-da! The conference was organized in Berlin half a year later with people from 34 different countries. So that was the idea, and we knew what was going well, getting people together. I'll return to that example uh, later uh, again. All right, so now you know what you want to achieve, and you know where things are going well. Then the next two questions are, what are the simple, crucial steps that people have to make? Because it should be very, very easy to go in the right direction. So that's the first steps. And when and where do you start? Because the books say there might be a good place and a bad place, or a good moment and a bad moment to start. For example, Mike Cohn writes in his book about selecting the best projects to start with Scrum. You have to think about these, these things. Uh, but the crucial steps, for example, that's something they did with the Agile Manifesto and the, the various Agile methods. Put up a whiteboard, 
have sticky notes on the board, and move them across the board. How easy can it be? Anyone can do that. Anyone can do that. Though this is, I admit, a bit of a strange picture. It is a whiteboard with sticky <coughs> notes that say cake and beer uh, here in the first column. So apparently this is somebody uh, planning a party or something. Or at the start of the party, he plans, this is the amount of beer that I'm going to drink, and this is the amount of cake that I'm going to eat, and then the sticky notes start moving across the board, and the person drinks and eats and drinks and eats, and at the end of the party, he shows to the host, look, I'm done. This is everything, everything is the left column, and we call that scrum. Right? We call that scrum. But some people say, you shouldn't estimate it all. You should just, just get started. Just drink as fast as you can, but only one beer at a time. We call that kanban. It's a slightly different version. But both of them are more or less the same. They have a whiteboard and sticky notes moving across the board. Crucial step, anyone can do that. So, that's the second part. The third part is check. How do you check whether things are going as you expected? Uh, or not? How do you get feedback? For example, uh, in my courses I use this, uh, this, this door. Not exactly physically this door. I don't know, carry a door around an airplane. But I use a door with sticky notes on them and, and the happiness index combined with, uh, with the evaluation wall. And it works. Because I wanted feedback earlier. I realized if I ask for evaluation forms at the end of the course, it's too late. I cannot change things anymore. So I did I started asking at lunchtime on the first day. And that gave me useful feedback and I adapted. And then I asked it again at the end of the first day. And people loved it. And they love to give feedback that, that way on the on the happiness door. So check when things are working and then <coughs> you have to do things again and again. You Hopefully you can accelerate and be prepared that you have to go through the cycle uh, uh, again uh, the next time. For example, with the, uh, with the tablet computers, uh, I've noticed that the iPad was the 15th attempt at creating a tablet computer. All the previous ones failed, including Apple's own Newton. Big failure. But I'm quite sure that Apple learned from all those previous failures. Some very useful input that they could, uh, could learn from and adapt. And it's the same with you as a, as a change agent. You have to learn and, and, and start again. So it is a never-ending cycle of experiments. And, that, uh, and what you're trying to change is a social system, and it will respond to your, to your experiments. Basically, you, you keep poking it with ideas and with experiments, see how it responds and changes. And I love this, this quote by Donella Meadow. She's a systems thinker. She said, we cannot figure systems out, but we can dance with them. I love that metaphor. It's, uh, she says, it's, here's this system, and you want, to, you want that system, the social system, to move in that direction, so you start dancing with the system. And hopefully, if you're a good dancer, you're able to go in the right direction. But maybe the system does this, and you think, oh my god, I'm not going in the right direction, I want to be over there. So you turn around, and then again, you walk in the right direction. If you're a good dancer, it might be you might end up with some bruised elbows and, and, and blue toes here and there, but that's what it means to be a change agent. So I find the metaphor useful. Actually, Brian Merrick, one of the 70 secretaries of the Agile Manifesto, used exactly the same one at a conference in, in Spain last year. Uh, he, he made everyone stand up during his keynote speech, and he made us dance the tango. It was in Spain. Here, this is Spain. <laughs> That's Spain, and it was at the XP conference in Spain. He made everyone dance up and, and turn around uh, 90 degrees, and he let us, made us dance the tango with, with our neighbors. And my neighbor was Lasse Koskela, a guy from Finland. This is Finland. And I was very glad that it was Lasse, because people from Finland are very silent. They don't say much. So I had hoped he would keep his mouth shut about it. Unfortunately, now Lasse has on his Twitter page, I once danced the tango with your Manapolo. <laughs> it's been there for a year. <laughs> Lesson learned, never dance the tango with people from Finland. Remember that. Alright. So, this is the end of part one. You want your organization to be more agile, or you want people to start pair programming, or, or whatever. You want to change people. Then ask yourself some questions, is what the book say. What exactly is your goal? 
where are things going well, what are the behaviors to be copying, what are the simple steps and have you thought when and where to start, uh, how will you get feedback and measure the results. And uh, are you prepared to do this again and again and again so that you can accelerate because it will never stop. That was part one. Part two, mind people. This is about the persons, people in the, in the social network. As I said, they have to change at the personal level. There's a model for that too. Surprise, surprise, ADCAR. The ADCAR model. It says it starts with awareness, but that is not the only thing that you should be doing. Well, usually people only focus on awareness. They send people messages like, starting next week, on Monday, everyone should be on time in meetings. Yeah, right, as if that's going to happen. That's just creating awareness. That is only one-fifth of everything that you should be doing, according to this, uh, to this model. But it is a start, you have to start somewhere. Like, for example, our governments, at least for many in Europe, pretend that they want us to stop smoking, which they don't really want to because they make a lot of money on, on, uh, on taxes. But anyways, they have this message that smoking kills, and it, it creates awareness. Right? That's one part. They know that the other part, the other four part, they won't implement, otherwise they won't be making money anymore. Uh, but this is this is creating awareness. This is step one. That's what that's what it starts. <coughs> Easy. And the second part, desire. This is more interesting. This is about the emotional part of, of people. <coughs> can you make it urgent or can you make it desirable? Uh, for example, uh, my, my my father last year. Uh, wasn't feeling very well and went to the doctor and the doctor said well I estimate that you have only three months to live unless you start changing your diet to have it right now because he has severe cardiovascular problems and then he started changing but he knew for years that he had bad eating habits like he really like french fries and lots of mayonnaise and things like that well he stopped that right that day but so far it only had been important he knew it was important, but it was never really urgent, right? Well, the doctor made it urgent. So this is what the, the, the books uh, agree on. You have to make, you have to have people feel that what is important is urgent. Somehow change or tweak that message. Tell them you, it's bad, it, you should start test driven development right now, or in three months you'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, more or less, that is the message that you want to give. Right? Second question is how do you make it desirable? There are plenty of experts that have great models for, for desirability, intrinsic motivation. I found Drive by Daniel Pink, a very popular book, the Self Determination Handbook by Declan Ryan, and Stephen Rice, um, uh, 16 Basic Motivators. I sort of mixed them all and came up with my own list of 10 intrinsic desires. And it gave me the very nice acronym or mnemonic that says CHAMP problem. I have absolutely no idea what champ rocks are, to be honest. Some, some person told me that there's a contest somewhere here in the United States where they have frogs jump across distances, and the, 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 the one that jumps uh, the longest distance is the champion, so that might be a champ frog there. <laughs> but I, I don't know how much of that is true. But uh, this is the champ frog scale. It's a useful model for intrinsic motivation. Basically, the books say somehow you have to connect your change uh, with people's intrinsic desires. And that could be adding something totally strange that has nothing to do with the real change, but that makes it desirable. I'll give an example. This is the best Dutch invention ever, I think. This is a urinal with a small picture of a fly in the urinal. Right? They have these at Schiphol Airport. That's where the first ones were. And now they, you find them all over the world. But this is a Dutch invention. I'm very, very proud of it. <laughs> now, this might be difficult for some people in the room, but just imagine that you're a man, right? Just imagine that you're a man, and you go to Schiphol Airport, and you think, ooh, you have to go to the, to the restroom, and you, you're standing there, and you think, hmm, am I able to flush away the fly? Well, that will be competence, right? Or mastery, that is, that's this one. Or sorry, or curiosity, could be as well. Curiosity, am I able to crush away the flies? 
Or can I hit it right between the eyes? <laughs> that would be mastery. Or some, some of the men might think, hmm, say goodbye to the world, it will fly. That would be power. A sense of power over other people or other, other flies. So this is, this is at least three points on the champ frog scale. It is, a, it is a fantastic invention. Now, somehow you have to do this as well with the changes that you're trying to, uh, to introduce. We coat medicine in sugar to have people, to have children eat them, right? Otherwise, it's not desirable. Add something that makes it, that makes it very interesting. All right. This is the Netherlands. You remember that, right? That's where I'm from. Very, very small country. We have only two highway exits. You should take the first one because the second one drops you right in the North Sea. <laughs> remember that. Very small country. Um, this is Sweden. They're part of the European Union. Very smart people. This is Norway, and not part of the European Union. Even smarter people. <laughs> Sweden, Norway. Sweden, Norway. I often go to conferences everywhere across Europe. I also obviously go to conferences in Sweden and Norway. And you know, Sweden versus Norway is always like, ah, they always fight a little with each other, right? So I have suggested that we ship urinals to Sweden and Norway, and then that Sweden should have the, the tiny version of the Norwegian flag. And of course, the other way around. You know. Hope that they will. Hope that they, they do that. That's, uh, that was the first part. Well, the second part of the, of the model, desire. Knowledge is the third one. This is easy. This is what we're here for. This is why we have conferences. This is why we have agile coaches and, and gurus and senseis and any, uh, any people who help uh, others to change their behaviors. Because sometimes we, we are aware of the need to change, we desire to change, but we don't know how. So we have to have people helping us out. That's the easy part, I would say. Ability is number four in this model. That is about making it easy, because even if people know how, <coughs> myself, people, people wanted to apply to test driven development, and there was somebody available for them to help them out with legacy frameworks. But then still, oh, the deadline of this Friday, and there was always something, there were always obstacles. Well, there's the responsibility for you as a change agent to remove all those obstacles. Do not give them any excuses anymore. You have to remove all those uh, blockades uh, and, and, and get it out of their way. For example, <coughs> this is one of my favorite examples, Amazon's uh, buy now with one click button. They have done exactly that. It's only one click of the button, and then you have purchased an item on their website. I've been warning people for, for months that after the red button in the White House, this is the most dangerous button in the world. <laughs> I clicked on it. I'm not kidding. I clicked on it last month. I wanted to store a book in my wish list, and I clicked on buy now with one click. Ta-da! I bought the book. I'm glad it was a book and an airplane. So uh, this, is, this is what Amazon did. They remove all the obstacles. Make sure that behavior easily flows in the right direction. And the last part of the model is reinforcement. That is about making sure that people are able to keep up with the right behaviors. Because uh, we all know uh, you're probably like me at the end of the year, have some New Year's resolutions like next year I'm going to work out some more. Right? Next year I'm finally going to call my mother. Things like that. Right? <laughs> So we have these, these New Year's resolutions, but fitness schools know that in January that is the busiest month. And in February things are back to normal again. That is typically the lack of reinforcement. People can't keep up. <clears throat> they know how to change, but they, they, they don't, it's not sustainable. So what people should be doing, and what the change agents should be doing, is adding things that make it sustainable. Like people hook up their Nike shoes to their smartphones and they start working out together with each other, they make it a social, they, 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 they make it into, turn it into a game, gamification, with all the rage these days. So add things that, are, that make it sustainable. Lots of websites nowadays are about earning awards and, 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 and playing games with each other, while at the same time adding, uh, adding useful information to the website, for example. Alright, so this is the ad car model. Sending rational messages is not enough. 
treat people as emotional beings and, uh, and they need a little bit of help. So if you have some challenging uh, uh, change programs, like you want you, uh, developers to educate themselves some more, or you want people to start pair programming, uh, what are the questions that you have to ask yourself according to the books? Well, you have to start by communicating well, but also understand how you can make things feel urgent or make it more desirable. Is there somebody there, a guru or a mentor, to, to help them uh, learn things? Who will, who will be teaching? And can you, can you make it easy? Can you remove all the obstacles? And what are the short-term wins and what makes it sustainable? That's the last part of the, of the model. For example, in my, own, in my own experience, I tried to write a book two times and I failed. The third time I succeeded was when I started to turn it into a blog. There's all the little feedback. The, the small replies and the compliments that I got every now and then, that were the, those were the short-term wins. It made it sustainable. I wrote one little bit of text at a time. And then after a year, I finished the book. So that's how you can do that with, with change. All right, third part, stimulate the network. There's a model for that too, the adoption curve. The innovation adoption curve, it is very famous. Basically it says, Change follows the number of people across the curve, different groups that you will that you will come across. Actually, I added one: the initiators. That's you. That is the people who want to change in other people. The ones who come up with an idea, say, "Let's start changing the world." I'm going to stay, change, start with this little piece around me. And the, the people that I know, they are the initiators. They have to ask themselves, "Are you really committed?" books were quite clear about that. It's a tough job, actually. It's not something that you just do on the side. No, you have to really be committed. And there should be people assisting you. Like this guy. I think probably some of you know him. He's a very famous change agent. Actually, he got a Nobel Prize just for the idea of changing the world. I thought it was a bit unfair. I had the same idea. <laughs> I didn't get a Nobel Prize. It was a bit unfair. Anyway. Um, he has, uh, he's not on his own, he has some broad shoulders to cry on, I see here. He's not on his own, he has a, a number of people helping him out, trying to change the world. And that's, uh, the same applies to any other change. But then the real curve starts, the adoption curve by Rogers, he says, uh, the first people to change are the innovators. They cannot wait to get started. They love the idea of, of Kanban, or they, they, they want to start yeah, programming, programming right uh, the next day once you, uh, once you make a suggestion. There are the people who stand in line for hours to purchase the, the next iPad just because it is from Apple and anything from Apple that must be amazing. Right? They are the innovators. You have to give them special attention because they are the ones who get that whole wave started. So treat them really, really well. Then the next group, the early adopters, mm, they're not prepared to stand in line for hours, but they're interested. Think, hmm, that might be cool. So let's see, let's see what those innovators are doing. And uh, the books say that there might be some hubs in the social network among the early adopters, the leaders, the people who know many other people. Once you get those on your side, then things will be much easier. And so you have to know who are the leaders to, to, to move, to, to, to uh, embrace in your change effort. The ones who know many people. They might not be innovators, but certainly the head of the rest of the curve. And then uh, the, the problem is you, you, you end up with, you, you get to the majority. That's the, the big part in the middle. That's when things get difficult. Because the majority is, it has different needs. They don't care about the iPad because it is from Apple. Who cares? They, they have a need. They want to see movies on the train. Well, you happen to be able to do that with an iPad. So that's a different need that you have to address. And uh, I learned that many times change agents forget that these are different people than those. They're able to convince the innovators and early adopters, but you have no idea how to deal with the majority. But they don't care that much. So you have to start planning. I do that with my courses, for example. I know that on my courses, I now have innovators and early adopters. I do not have the majority. But I'm, I'm thinking about it. That's the least I can do. How can I change things to start addressing that bulk of people in the middle? And they say many ideas drop in a chasm. 
right here in between those two. They drop in a chasm, they're unable to get out if you don't think about the majority. How will they be different? And then the lay majority, that's the second half of the majority, they are the skeptics. They think, hmm, this is not going to work. Doesn't make sense. The iPad, just for iPhones, they're together. Doesn't make sense. I was like that. I thought it was a ridiculous idea the first time I saw it. I thought, who's going to walk around with a phone like this? It's not very comfortable, right? But now I have a tablet computer. Well, not by iPad, but at least I have a tablet. So apparently skeptics can be convinced in the end once you get past the curve. <clears throat> so that's possible. The challenge is the last group, the laggards. They will do anything they can to resist. Basically, there's only, thing, only one thing that you can do is hope that they die. <laughs> okay, or maybe move elsewhere or, or whatever, right? So hope that they go away and neutralize any efforts that they, that they have trying to resist. But what, what is quite, quite clear from the literature that I, that I read is sometimes the change agents think that they're done when they convince the majority and say, hey, now it's easy, now it's just a matter of sliding down the scale, isn't it? No, no, that's actually the wrong approach. If you, if you stop monitoring here, and if you go away and think, okay, we're done, next, next business to, to convert, the laggards will rise, and the laggards will start undoing all the work that you've done, and you, the whole organization will revert back to its own behaviors. It's like a very, very big control Z that happens, right? So all the way back to here. And I have, I have an Andrew coach that convinced me that this is exactly what happened with him in his last organization. He, he stopped too soon. Uh, it is interesting if you're a coach, because you can start all over again with the same organization, if you're a consultant. <laughs> that, might be, that might be a cool way of making money. Just stop here every time. It's a recurring business. But um, this might not be what you're after. So make sure that you, that you pay attention to the, to the lab. And in the end, they will either have to move elsewhere, that happens, or be convinced by the majority. Don't stop too soon. That was the, that was the clear message that I, that I picked up. All right. So these are, uh, these are this is about the transactions, about the, in, uh, or the interactions, I mean, in the social network. Behaviors are transmitted as if it is a virus. You want that beneficial virus to be, to be copied. Uh, and you have to monitor where you are in the network, because that will uh, that means you have to change your approach. So if you have uh, some uh, some great challenge, like I want people to, to read my book, or I want people to use my services, or, or read my blog, or uh, buy my product, then what, these are the questions you have to ask yourself. Are you really committed, and is there somebody assisting you? Like, I'm not on my own <coughs> with everything that I do. I always have people helping me out. Who will be the innovators? And who will be the leaders and early adopters? And, and do you know how the majority is different from those earlier groups? Because that's a very important question. And will you deal with the skeptics? Uh, because the skeptics give you very useful information. Uh, you can learn from the skeptics. Use that information to your advantage. And uh, deal with the relapse. Uh, prevent the relapse, preferably. Keep monitoring. Uh, even if you're nearly at the end, you should not stop too soon. All right, that was part three. Last part, part four, change the environment. Very interesting topic, because according to the systems uh, experts, the systems scientists, uh, self-organization can lead to anything. But self-organization uh, is, is tweaked by the boundaries. It can only exist with, uh, within a boundary. That's what a, another Nobel Prize winner, Ilya Pitergin, uh, from uh, University of Brussels came, uh, came up with. He said self-organization only exists if there is a boundary. So you might be able to tweak the boundary and things will self-organize in, in a different way. Well, surprise, surprise. There's a model for that too. There's a model for that too. It's called uh, the five eyes. Actually, it's called the four eyes. But I inserted this one, infrastructure, because I think it's a bit different and because now I can call it my own model. So now it's my five eyes. Five eyes model, not somebody else's boring four eyes model. Right? My five eyes model. 
So it starts with information. This is this is easy for agilists because we know all about information radiators, don't we? We love informa information radiators. Broadcast back to the system that what, what the status is, what their behavior is, and it will change them. For example, this is a picture that's taken here in this country. I recognize the type, I saw it. Uh, I believe in San Francisco, exactly the same, uh, the same type. Uh, speed limit is 25, your speed is 48. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> That's what it does, nothing else. It turns out, according to the research, that this has a better effect on people's behaviors than police cars hidden behind billboards. You're simply putting up an information radiator. Speed limit 25, your gun 48. Oops, sorry, hope nobody's looking. Uh, nobody's getting a fine here, nobody's being ticketed or whatever. <clears throat> so what this is information radiator doing its work. It works much better. Except in Italy. <laughs> it's true. I was I did my course in Italy, I did that a few weeks months ago. Sorry. Where is it? Where is it in Italy? Where is no where is Italy? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> Except in Italy. This is it. <laughs> in Italy, in Italy, they told me when I did my course in Bologna, they started laughing when they saw this picture. Ah, ah that's not going to work here. They told me that's not going to work here because the Italian driver will start experimenting. <laughs> they want to know if this display can show third digits. <laughs> They're going to start driving backwards to see if there can be a minus sign here. That's what they told me. I'm not. I mean, I'm not Italian. Right? They, they, they thought it was very amusing. So information radiators work everywhere except Italy. So that's why in the European Union, we're trying to consider if we can somehow change the world and move Italy over here. <laughs> we'll give a whole new meaning to the word New York pizza. <coughs> All right. So that's information. Change the information around the people that will influence the behavior. We know that, right? And, and, and hear from some teams that they have these these red the red lights going off, and whenever somebody broke the build, it says Joe did it. Joe did it. And then Joe has to wear the the hat with the funny fluffy uh, the fluffy bunny ears for at least a day. That's that's an information radiator. It will certainly change people's behavior. The second part, that's identity. That's a very interesting one. This is about the group identity. And, and, and having peer pressure do its work for you. A very a useful example here, this is a picture of a typical Dutch family. <laughs> Some of you might have seen it. This is what I'm afraid my fellow countrymen do. They dress up in very, very strange ways, uh, all in orange, referring to the royal color uh, and, and uh, lots of uh, references to Dutch culture. They do this at every 30th of April when we celebrate Queen's Day. No idea why you should celebrate that you have royalty, but anyway, that's that's what we do. And uh, and when there are big international football matches, so they did that for the last couple of weeks, but they can stop doing that right now. <laughs> no reason to go around like this anymore. Um, why do they do that? Because they feel part of an identity. There's this Dutch identity that is peer pressuring people into behaving in weird ways and dress up in strange clothes. And that's that's what is expected of you. So identity is really changing people's behaviors. The Dutch are not the only ones, by the way, of course, right? Everyone does this. I have a picture from a from a typical Canadian family here. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. So uh, I use this to my advantage as well. When I started working on Agile Lean Europe, uh, trying to get the Europeans to work together, I sort of abused you guys. I admit, I, I abused the US. I, I'm totally honest about that. Because what I did, uh, and that's not a lie, actually, but at European conferences, on average, half of the keynote speakers are Americans. For good reasons, because you saw the top 10, most of them are Americans, right? There so are lots of things that we can learn from Americans. But, if it's about fighting with each other uh, uh, because of organized work, because of cultural diversity and uh, geographical uh, layout and things like that, some things we know more about as Europeans. 
So I said, this is all, all nice that we have all those Americans coming here, but some of the problems we have to solve ourselves. Let's start working out among ourselves how we should change Europe. And people said, yeah, yeah, we're Europeans, let's start changing Europe. Then I'm done. It was an identity thing. It was a trick that I employed, but it worked pretty well. <laughs> this is with the Netherlands, right? Remember that? That's the Netherlands. This is Denmark. This is another country. Give you an example of, uh, of uh, uh, something that happened a few years ago. I was some, uh, uh, somebody on my blog who was an American said, Oh, you're from the Netherlands. Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, do you know Johan Christiansen in Copenhagen? <laughs> I said, What? <laughs> Copenhagen, Denmark, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So I said, uh, no, no, sorry, I do not know Johan Christensen in Copenhagen, but do you know Pablo Gonzalez in Mexico? <laughs> he was offended. <laughs> I don't get it. He was offended. I asked the same question. <laughs> this happens this happens all the time. This happens all the time. With I'm Dutch, right? I'm Dutch. I, I, I sometimes apologize when I start keynotes. I tell people, I'm sorry, I'm Dutch. Because Dutch people are very honest and open, they say whatever they think. There's, there's, with other people, there is this part of their brain in, bet in between the part where they think and the part where they speak that filters most of it. In Dutch DNA, that got stripped out. <laughs> we don't have it anymore. So I always tell people, whenever I offend you uh, during a conference, you should think, oh my god, it's so brave to go on stage with a mental deficiency. <laughs> that is so awesome that you're going to try anyway. So, um, <clears throat> anyways, if I offended any one of you, just think, this, that's, that's, that's my problem. So this is typical, uh, and, and that's how I explain some For some situations, for some problems, we have, to, we have to get Europe's own act together. That's, that's a big problem. But we, we tried and we succeeded because, as I said, we organized a conference with uh, people from 34 different countries. And the one thing that happened during the conference, they, they started creating a sticky part version of the logo on the window. I've never been at a conference where they started creating a sticky note version of the logo on the window. And this was the logo of the of Agile in Europe. This is a reference to a Belgian beer glass. Supposed to be a Belgian beer glass, these big glasses, they're quite pretty wide and have a whole lot of beer. Uh, though the French think it is a wine glass, that's okay. That's no problem. Uh, the British think it's the Holy Grail. <laughs> Looks like a martini. I don't mind. Sorry? Looks like a martini glass. The martini glass. Oh, that's also, as long as there's alcohol in it. That, <laughs> that would be fine. Yes, yes. The, the, the Irish think, my God, that's a strange whiskey glass. <laughs> and the Russians don't care as long as there's what kind. So uh, this is France, by the way. This is France. Inspired. Uh, the French themselves think that Europe looks like this. <laughs> it's true, it's true. I, I, I had the same picture in, in Canada. Someone came to me and said, oh, I'm from France and you're exactly right. That was awesome. Uh, and this is the United Kingdom. The British are here. Though they themselves think that Europe looks like this. <laughs> Ireland, this is Ireland. They have a pretty accurate picture of, of Europe, the Irish. And this is, this is the big, scary. Oh, that's, that's, that's Russian. All right, that was a geography lesson, March 6th. Does anyone have this bracelet? Green code bracelet by Uncle Bob? Any green bracelets here in the room? It's a small room. Sometimes there's one, sometimes two in the audience. Okay, so Uncle Bob has some more evangelization to do here. I'm afraid. Oh, he is trying to do the same thing. He's trying to make sure that whenever you're typing your code, and it's nearly 5 o'clock, and you just finished your, the class, you think, oh, I'm going to ship this without a test. Or, I'm going to ship this without unit testing, because I want to go home and pick up the kids from school and things like that. So you're typing away and think, I'm going to ship this anyway. Who cares? And then you see the bracelet, and you think, oh my god, oh, what is Uncle Bob going to say when he finds out that I'm not writing a test for this? He's going to kill me. Right? So you write the test anyway. And that's, that's exactly what he's trying to do with the green bracelet. Create an identity about being a clean coder, a software professional. I like that. All right, we're nearly there. Incentives is the, is the third part of the model. This is how we raise children. 
This is how we train animals. Uh, this is how we, how, we, how we teach people with small rewards for good behavior. Ooh, you peed on a potty. How good of you. Here's a cookie. With animals, not with, uh, not with children, not with animals. <laughs> so um, that's, that works. The science says that it works only if you use small rewards. You do not give your children $100 million bonus for peeing on the potty. Okay? Just a cookie. That's enough. And decentralized good behavior, good behaviors are harder to cheat. For example, it is better to incentivize uh, children doing their homework instead of children earning high grades in school. Because high grades can be, can be fixed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is Iceland, by the way. This is Iceland, far away, and for good reasons. They have banks there, they would use a lot of in incentives for people to store money in the banks in Iceland, people from the UK, people from the Netherlands, and they were completely unaware that those banks were built inside a volcano. <laughs> so all the money went and gone it was. So we keep that we keep that country well for good reasons. Incentives that was. Part four, infrastructure. That's, that is the one that I added because I think it's a bit different. This is about changing the physical infrastructure <coughs> around people. Uh, here's a picture from Schiphol Airport, rated again as the best airport in Europe. And that's because they are masters at manipulating your behaviors. You don't know it when you're there, but it happens, as with the little fly and things like that. Uh, they, they tweak the infrastructure, the escalators and, and everything around you to make sure that you first end up at the tax-free shops and then at the gates. Right? That is the kind of behavior that they want to, <coughs> want to have, uh, have happen. So I read an article in Art Business Review just a few weeks ago and they said simply changing the office layout, like turning tables around so that people were facing each other instead of looking at each other's backs or lengthening the lunch table so that there was a higher chance of people having lunch together instead of sitting alone. That alone had a huge impact on productivity in organizations. Very small infrastructural things that you could do. I noticed that account managers were putting up a whiteboard and having daily stand-up meetings because they saw, literally saw, some developers doing that. Because we had a big open office space so everyone could see everyone. It was very useful. I could always see who stole my chair. <laughs> and the account managers saw that, that uh, some developers were doing this cool scrum, scrum thing, having daily standards. Oh, let's do that too. So that is what a lack of walls can, can achieve. This is the Netherlands. You remember that? Mm -hmm. All right, good. And uh, the Netherlands is, uh, we, we have this, I told you about being offensive. We have this, uh, this, this, this phrase that all countries in the world uh, seem to have, like, like uh, stepping on people's toes, that's, a, that's to offend them, right? That's a common, uh, common English uh, uh, phrase. We have that in our language as well. In, in the Netherlands, we have the reverse expression. I'm not kidding you. I'm not, I'm not making this up. We, our, our expression is, other people have long toes. So we have step on. <laughs> Oh my god, oh, she's offended again. Oh, long toes. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a matter of perspective. It's just a matter of perspective. So, anyone with long toes here? <laughs> no way? Okay, good. Doing well so far. Alright, so that's another one. Institutions, last one. <clears throat> This is a useful one, I think. This is about the guilds, the, the, the self-organized entities that can change people's behaviors. This is a picture of the, of the guilds in Brussels. Actually, they're not guilds anymore. They're now chocolate shops for, for unsuspecting American tourists thinking that the best chocolates are here. They're not there. <laughs> you have to email me when you want to know where the best chocolates are. Uh, but uh, they were guilds. Uh, to a few hundred years ago, they, they were those self-organized entities that said, if you're a carpenter or in, in this region or are doing masonry or whatever, then these are the rules for carpenters. Otherwise, you can't do work here. And this it was endorsed by, 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 by the government. You can have something similar in organizations. I learned that at Spotify in, in Sweden, they actually call their communities of practice guilds over there. 
I love it because it has this association with craftsmanship. You, you're a craftsman, you're, you're a tester or developer, and you're part of the guild. And these are the things that you do to be part of the guild. And without management being bothered, because this is all self-organized. I love it. So this is the environment. This was a model for the environment. And sometimes you can change the environment instead of changing people them directly, because that can be quite expensive without a, an operating table. Now this quote is the last one I'm going to bother you with. This is uh, from uh, John Potter's book, Leading Change. But that number one problem you saw, organizational culture is the most, uh, most often mentioned as an obstacle. So people ask me sometimes, literally, how can we change the organization's culture? Good question. But Potter says, it changes only when you have successfully altered people's actions and when a new behavior produces a group benefit for a period of time. So basically he says, in other words, you should be doing what Jürgen has just been talking about for the last 40, 50, 60 minutes. And if you're successful at it, and if the new behavior is sustainable, you will have changed your organization culture. It's the outcome. It's not item one on a checklist, I'm afraid. So, if you have a big challenge, like you want people to come to a conference, or you want to start test-driven development, or, or, or you want them to pick up Kanban instead of Scrum or whatever. What are the questions that you can ask yourself? How do you use information radiators? Can you use peer pressure? Can you use some identity, group identity? Uh, can you incentivize good behaviors with small rewards? Uh, can you play around with the infrastructure that will change people's behaviors? And is there some, some guild there, some, some informal institute that you can organize and that can can make the rules for people in an informal way. So I call this change management 3.0. As a tongue in cheek reference to, uh, to the book, Management 3.0, this is not in the original book, so it's sort of self organized into this little book, uh, How to Change the World. And uh, it is uh, it's available as PDF from Lulu and, uh, and the physical version as you, as you see right now. And I know that all of you are struggling with change. If you want to ask at conferences, there's always something that people want to change, whether they want to have their colleagues uh, start start uh, developing themselves some more, or, or you want the world to take, to take Chihuahua serious as a real dog. That was a very, very challenging, challenging change effort, I would say. I would start with poodles, that's easier. <laughs> but if there's something that you want to change, then uh, Take into account that, is, that there's a few models helping you, like change at the personal level, change at the environmental level, and there's this social network that needs to change, and do things iteratively. All that combined, I believe, is a great cocktail for, uh, for change. So if you want to read more details, I would suggest that you pick up the book, and uh, the presentation is available on SlideShare if you, uh, if you want to check it out. Thank you for your attendance. And uh, maybe somebody has a, a question or two. Oh, and by the way, for the best question, not the first one, but the best question, I have a free copy of this book available. What part of the model is that, do you think? Incentivization or desire, exactly. So, any questions? Yes, please. So, uh, do you find that there are people that will never change, can't ever change, and just should be taken off the team. Does that happen frequently? Yes and no. Um, so the question is, do you find that sometimes nobody wants to change, and uh, they're still on your team as dead weight, or whatever you want to call them? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, whenever we encounter such situations, then in 80 or 90 percent of the cases, people have not been good change agents. They have not tried everything that there is possible, like incentives, the information radiators, peer pressure, whatever. There's so much to do. If you simply read one or two of the books that I refer to, you get a lot of ideas. So I'm sure in most cases, yeah, the ideas have not been exhausted. But I am sure there are some people that are simply waiting for their pension, just two more years. <laughs> If I can keep on that long, I'm out of here. And they have no reason whatsoever to change. But um, there are some who say, well, anyone is able to, to, to change as 
look at if there's something interesting happening. I mean, uh, as I said in, uh, said in my book, if people love Lady Gaga or Justin Bieber, that doesn't require a change management program. No, you just present something that is interesting. So you have to come up with something that is interesting. Even for those last few. But it can be really, really hard. <laughs> Right, thanks. Changing early adopters is probably like a catch-22. Okay. Uh, so how would you address that? Because like your sorry, early majority is like catch-22. Mm -hmm. Well, the early adopters are forgiven, and your innovators are probably like skipping the process. Yes. And your early majority is looking for somebody who's similar, uh, and it's always kind of difficult to cross uh, from early adopters to early majority. What yeah. Happens? I'm trying to understand the question. So he said the, the, the early adopters are different from the early majority. I agree with that because the, the early majority wants something. Uh, uh, how did you phrase it? Uh, it's like a catch 22 because the early majority, okay, if I'm bringing about some program, the early adopters are kind of readily forgiving and accepting if yeah. something. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, this is from four steps to three. Mm -hmm. so, but the early majority is always looking for another early majority example. So yeah. breaking that part is always difficult. Yeah. 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 How would you do that? Well, I would, that that depends on your on your uh, change uh, program. I would I would say I'm trying to solve the problem right now with my course right? uh, uh, because I know, as I said, that uh, I have innovators and early adopters there. They're quite enthusiastic. But I cannot simply copy that to the majority because the majority will not become enthusiastic just from the enthusiastic storage of the early adopters. They don't care. To give you a positive yeah. example, like your pilot adoption process, the adoption process may succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a couple of two of them may succeed, but then when the whole organization kind of moves, like we're trying to uh, apply the same solution which works with the early adopters mm -hmm. and the majority and it's really back Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't believe there's a, a general pattern there. I just I, I can simply reiterate the fact that you have to think about it and, and try to see it from a totally different angle. And uh, probably the, 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 the quite often the early majority just wants to have a small problem solved. Like they cannot really see movies well on a train. Oh, hap the, the, the iPad happens to solve that problem, for example. And they're not interested in the iPad for the reasons that the early adopters or the innovators are interested in the, in the iPad. But what applies to the iPad in terms of uh, uh, the transition from early adopters to early majority is totally different from what applies to my uh, course, for example. We still have to answer the same uh, questions, but the solutions, I do not see patterns there that you can simply apply. Yeah, then it will be easy. <laughs> I would make a lot of money, I would say, I would say if, I, if I knew that, the answer to that question. But it is, it is one of the, the, the toughest questions that we struggle with, because so many products fall in the chasm, right? Yeah, they have no idea how to solve it. So I would simply say that this in itself proves that there is no universal pattern or answer there. You have to figure it out on a case-by-case basis. Challenge. Uh, who was first? We have one more question over there, and then I think that we're going to go into one. Then we'll disperse, and I'll we'll hang out for a few more minutes. One more question, that should be enough for you to find out who had the best question. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Which, so I mean, we had this, I had this conversation a lot with other coaches and peers of mine, and, and we talk about transformation all the time, and you know, one of the comments that we've all agreed to is that Agile transformation is like a unicorn. We've all heard about it, but none of us have actually seen one. And um, I think that in your experience, my opinion is that unless you come in here and not here, it's not going to work. Because you can't, I mean, you know, everybody says top up, bottom down. Really, you got to be top down, mm -hmm. and then you got to come around and kind of get the bottom. But you, you have to come in here, because if you don't come here, and you come here, and you talk this here, yeah. they're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. Because it's here where the pain is, down here. They're recipients of the pain, and I don't think people change unless you can figure out the pain. Because if there's no pain, yeah. they're not changing. Because yeah. they're not going to change for sake of change, yes. right? Yeah. So you got to identify the pain, and that pain is here. Yeah. And and I don't. What's your experience yeah. with that? Is it have you have you seen the same thing? Yeah, um, actually, uh, many people struggle with that same uh, the same question. 
Um, I heard some very good comments on it. Um, actually, the, the statistics say that nowadays 80% of the agile transformations are started uh, from management layers, mm -hmm. but that is uh, everything added together, like project managers, line managers, top managers, every, everything together, that's 75, 80%. Uh, so that might be good in itself. They see that this is something, they want to jump onto the bandwagon, but that they don't know how to do it well. Because the biggest problems that we saw, they're all management problems. Change management, organizational culture, hiring, hiring the right people, management support, it's all management problems. So they, they start it and then they screw up. <laughs> that would be my, my conclusion. Um, but you're right, you need, uh, some say you need a hamburger approach, uh, top to bottom and bottom, <laughs> and bottom to top. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then squeeze the layers in between because uh, I would agree with some, and I believe Alistair Colbert was one who said, Top and bottom are the easiest. The difficult part is, is in the middle. And they have to be squeezed from both directions. If it's just bottom up, it won't work. If it's just top bottom, it might also not work. You have to squeeze it. <laughs> have top, man top management, the, the, the management team, and the teams uh, somehow uh, 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 coordinate things and, and also explain to managers what, what is the alternative. That is what I'm try to explain that there's still a lot of stuff that they have to do being in the middle there somewhere but they don't know what it is and if, as I keep on explaining if, if the intrinsic motivators are for them uh, status and power they will never give up so you have to give something else in return that gives them other intrinsic motivation right. for them to manage the system I find it fascinating management system managing systems yeah. without feeling a superior to anyone else. I couldn't care uh, feeling superior to anyone else. But they're all knowledge workers. They know how to do their job better than I do. But still, my specialization is managing the system. Hey, I'm a manager. That's my job. I love that. Uh, but uh, it depends on how people's brains are wired. But they, you have a very good, a good point. And this is something that we will struggle with for the next few decades. Yeah, I think so too. I also think, one, last 20 seconds, uh, that we have to rely more on the new generations. Uh, some some people say we should the lar large portion of, of management we have to write off and, and, and hope that they disappear because now we raise new generations of, of, of children and young employees. They say I'm not going to be bossed around by somebody who says they are my superior. Are you kidding? They know other ways of organizing things with social networks and stuff. So we can rely more to have them I think with the younger generation. Thank you. Thank you. You only mentioned the other point, but did you have the last question? I think the honor goes to the first uh, first one. Thank you. I just want to say one round of applause for the rest of you, and I think that's so very, 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 very informative, but also very entertaining talk. And uh, what I wanted to highlight actually, two on your two books on uh, two writers, authors on your list on your personal book is uh, Linda Rising and Chris Avery. Yeah. They actually spoke at National University mm -hmm. in the keynote at our events before. Um, we, I am actually tracking uh, uh, Robert Martin, Paul Martin on the phone. Yeah. Trying yeah. to get those. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get him in here too. And I'm pretty right. sure once Bob is here, he's going to talk about the five eyes from Jürgen. You know? <laughs> That's the kind of thought leadership we're bringing here to New York. But you, you do want to stop here at 7. Everybody has to catch trains on these things. So we stop at 7. You still around for a few more minutes? I will oh, be here for a few more minutes. Okay. Sure, if you want to ask questions. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.